Doctor Who season 13 was a time of Zygons, antimatter, robot mummies, Haley Ibrahim, androids, premium Chibnall, Canon, and a tall Frankenstein thing. On that note, I find it interesting that much of this particular series lends itself towards pre established literature and mythology. Alongside Frankenstein, you also get glimmers of Jekyll and Hyde, a whole wodge of Egyptian mythology, and the season 13 wrap up party that was the Seeds of Doom is no exception. Namely, concerning the first two episodes of this six parter, which have massive The Thing vibes. You decide which one, only that The Thing, which was probably your favourite and mine, wasn't made for another six years, even though the beards are nearly identical. So you can bet that this was inspired by the 1951 Thing from Another World, maybe more so than the original J.R. Campbell short story Who Goes There, as the 1951 Howard Hawks film and only the 1951 Howard Hawks film had the alien threat as a green thing walking around in the snow attacking people. Snap. Chosen Chimp here. The Antarctic based opener of Seeds of Doom is really great and these models make me a happy chimp. But the bulk of the story and the really, really fun stuff happens in the very green mansion of millionaire Harrison Chase. It's a great location. Filmed at the Athelhampton House in Dorset, this area has a complex real life lineage of ownership that dates back a thousand years, I'm not kidding. But the hall as we see it was built in the late 15th century and these lovely gardens with the big pointy trees were cultivated in the late 19th century. I spent a lot of time on the website and saw no mention of the true culmination of this property's presence in the world appearing in Doctor Who, which I think is a shame. I mean, Seeds of Doom was the one thing to make me aware that this place even existed. Look how nice it looks there. Main villain Chase's moral compass regarding protecting the world's plant life would be pretty bang on if he weren't the maniacal glove-wearing murderer type. When Richard Dunbar of the World Ecology Bureau shows up, Chase immediately grills him for not putting a stop to the torturous practice of cultivating bonsai trees. He barely says hello. This guy would be more suited to a Bond film. Instead, he's got the Doctor to contend with. You know that guy who punches people and carries a gun? The Doctor is pure fire in this one. The more perilous the situation, the happier he gets. The Seeds of Doom does not sit on its hands. It builds and builds and then goes boom. It's one hell of a ride. Okay then, all it takes is two explorers to find a 20,000 year old snowy pod and we're off. The Doctor knows it's from space, so he's up there in a flash. See, right here is what jars me about the Doctor's outfit. I spend a lot of time watching fourth Doctor stories, thinking to myself, man, he must be hot and all of that. And now he just looks horribly underdressed. He just can't seem to get the balance right. Chase is also sending out a team, headed by Chief Henchman Boise, sorry, Scorby. And this poor, currently human but not for much longer dude, Keeler. Everybody wants a piece of the pod, but the pod has ideas of its own. It wastes no time latching onto this dude, filling his bloodstream full of schizophytes, plant bacteria. And if you'd like a romanticized version of a human being symbiotic relationship with a plant, then you're not having it. Instead, you're getting this. Well, thanks for that. What an honor for this guy that must be. He ain't just turning green, he's turning axon green. Literally, it's just an axon costume painted green. And now he's running around willy-nilly in the cold killing folk. Okay, sorry, it's not an axon, it's a crinoid. So Chase's henchmen run a lot of trickery, deception, and highly commendable stupidity. But they really should be working together because this creature's desire to make people dead is insatiable. It kills all the expedition people in two episodes flat. Okay, this is more complicated than we bargained for, and there's a lot to get through, so just blow the base up. So long, tiny models, you exploded in commendable fashion. Before all that though, the Doctor and Sarah Jane find a second pod. Is that real snow? I know that tiny bit up his nose might be. And now we're gonna find out what it's really capable of doing. Mansion-based horror. This is more like it. Look at all those lovely plants, I'd really like to live there. There's a whole subplot between Dunbar and Chase where Dunbar wanted a big fat kickback in return for going outside the law to get Chase the pot. And now he's actually shocked at the length that Chase went to to acquire it. What do you expect? Look at those gloves. But the Doctor ain't backing down. He's putting this gaggle of chins to rights with a rage that would make his dandy predecessor proud. But the trail to the manor is fraught with danger. The Doctor has to pull this sinister chauffeur into a door and get him all muddy just to get by. And then, yeah, all right, Doc, calm yourself. When they do reach the ever so green location, the Doctor dresses as a sort of weird milkman and just walks in front of the guards until they notice and start shooting. Not the most well-executed infiltration. This is why psychic 
magic paper was invented. Chase plans to execute his captives, but not before he treats them to a bit of music. A cacophony of sonic horror reminiscent of a noise-driven industrial breakcore act. Not fully recognised as a genre of music until decades later. Imagine one of the more obscure Aphex Twin tracks, but there's no real tempo. You gotta be really into this subcategory of music to distinguish it, so I'll contextualise it in a way that Doctor Who fans can understand. It sounds like the soundtrack to the Sea Devils. The Doctor says it's horrible. He's wrong. It's just a bit too early. This guy's invented electronic music about 10 years before it got popular. It's amazing, way ahead of its time, and I could listen to Chase Virk's rendition of Floranium Requiem dedicated to Linnaeus all jeffing day, and I'm sure that you could too. Come on. They escape again. The Doctor actually physically breaks Scorby's neck. Well, that's this video restricted. It's okay, Scorby seems to have unbroke it back. Ooh, look out for the weeping angel. Sarah gets kidnapped again. Well, this is getting exhausting. And Chase is about to expose her to the crinoid. Before the doctor smashes through the skylight and brains a broken neck Scorby with a chair and brandishes a gun. Chase says with admirable composure, what do you do for an encore doctor? I don't know, maybe kill someone at this rate? And they're back in the garden hiding from the guards again. How many episodes are there of this? It's the same thing happening over and over, like Eve of the Daleks. No, I'm joking, it picks up. It does get cool, really cool actually. Keeler, as if he hadn't been through enough in this story already, gets infected by the crinoid. And it's really unnerving how all he wants to do is go to hospital and this inconsiderate madman is going, no, it's fine, just have a lie down and let nature do its thing. I mean, yeah, they give him a bed, but they drag him across the flipping estate to get him there. Shots like this cause me to put Chase's entire bedside manner into question. You're changing into a plant, Keeler. I shall need some equipment to monitor this experiment. He must feel extremely reassured. Here, have some strange sausages. I don't know what those are. Scorby captures the doctor, come on, and cue the shredder. This thing takes up a lot of screen time. Everyone gets a go at almost being killed by it, and Chase spends no end of screen time talking about it like it's some sort of pet. If they edited all the shredder scenes out of this story, I think it would only go on for a couple of episodes, and I don't need to talk you through all of this because you know the doctor doesn't get shredded, so we'll move on. Keeler ain't much of a Keeler no more. And this is just the start. Overall, I love how the story develops the enemy from a minor threat to a full-blown Armageddon-sized squiggle of terror. And this is one of the pit stops it makes along its uncontrollable growth. So long, Dunbar. It's pretty cool, despite looking slightly like one of the musicians in Jabba the Hutt's palace. Of course, we're dealing with the age when Doctor Who worked with what they had. So it's not just stop-motion models to suggest its bigness, as awesome as shots like that are, but also big tentacles smashing through windows and thrashing leaves behind windows and the likes. This house is screwed. Molotov cocktails? Forget about it. Phone calls? Not on your Nelly. Seeds of Doom is a brilliant story and the last two episodes really showcase that. There is however a scene where the plant talks in a big booming voice and I'm not sure about that. But it only happens once so I'm prepared to look away and if you think that's cool then you're right too. The bigger the crinoid rampage, the bigger the smile on Chase's little face. People dying? Absolutely fine, just so long as the plant stays safe, and that he gets to take pictures. Even getting flattened by the crinoid doesn't stop him. He gives a big speech to his plant using his evil drum machine and rallies them under the banner of the mighty crinoid to declare war on humanity, starting with these three. Anyway, let's talk about Scorby and his emotionally fulfilling redemption story arc. There isn't one. The Doctor and Sarah Jane try their level best to bring him on side and every time he almost sees the light, he just throws a big wobbler and shouts or sits in the corner and talks about how he's going to die in a minute. I'd love to have seen him survive with a fresh perspective and he almost alludes to that. But no, plaster, big puddle, plants. Yeah, the Doctor is outmatched here. It's time to make the call. You know which one. The Chosen Chimp is proud to introduce another edition of Unit Doing Stuff. Today, doing things sort of properly, huh? Okay, folks, Major Beresford. Yeah, that guy. Brigadiers in Geneva, or so he says. So we get Major Beresford and his alternate squaddy of unit soldiers instead. Yeah, I don't know who they are either. No Sergeant Benton either. Instead, we get Sergeant Henderson. Captain Yates? Yeah, he was never going to show up. 
It's like unit, but it's not unit. It's weird. Sergeant Henderson and the Doctor bring in some weed killer and absolutely cover Sarah Jane in this stuff. Hard luck on the butler. Then Henderson uses his military training to help the Doctor move some plants. I'm struggling a bit here. Major Beresford brings this laser to shoot the crinoid and whilst it doesn't have much of an effect, it doesn't accidentally make the monster even bigger either. Beresford, on realising that the laser isn't working, calls for a steady retreat, which is sensible, and none of the soldiers fall over while they're running away. Everyone survives. Look how composed they all are. Beresford orders an airstrike and it works. Some well-placed missiles and the monster is defeated. By unit. It was easy. <sighs> ah, there you go. Sergeant Henderson gets himself captured and almost shredded. That's more like it. We'll make a Benton out of him yet. And to be fair, Beresford made little or no effort to rescue the Doctor and Sarah, which Lethbridge definitely would have done, so you can shove your organised and well-trained unit any day major. Next time, bring me the unit that would have made the assault half as efficient with twice the deaths. I think we can all agree that that's what we paid for. Speaking of shredders, you reap what you shred, Chase. He went in legs first, that must have sucked. The Doctor and Sarah Jane steam their way to freedom. What a messy old load of carnage, but jolly good fun. All in a day's work, great stuff. Time to take a holiday in the snow with a beach ball. I agree, it is funny. What other Doctor Who stuff would you like me to talk about? Sound off in the comments and don't forget to hit subscribe. Have a good one.